Hi, Kinesiology 4120. Welcome to our lecture on bioenergetics. So today we're going to talk about how our body resynthesizes ATP using anaerobic and aerobic pathways. This is going to be a longer lecture than our previous ones. Um, so if you want to break it up into smaller chunks, please do so, but please make sure that you go through the entire lecture. Um, don't just skip through. Um, there's going to be key points in here that will be referenced on your quiz and on your exam. All right, let's get going. So to start off, let's look at metabolism. Metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions in our body, both anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions. Anabolic re reactions are where we synthesize molecules. So we are taking energy and some other molecules and synthesizing new molecules. Well, catabolic reactions are where we break down molecules into smaller molecules and available energy. It, there are two different ways that we, we look at these. We have endergonic reactions. These require energy to be added. Um, so think about those anabolic reactions we looked at earlier. We need energy to be put into the system in order to cause that reaction. Exergonic reactions release energy, or they take what is already available or what this potential energy that's within the chemical and break it down and release energy. Most of our actions will be coupled reactions where we will um, take the energy that is creating during an exergonic reaction in order to perform a new endergonic reaction. So we release energy so that we can use energy for a new reaction, break down, resynthesize, and use that energy that's created within. So if we look at how we break down glucose in this available image, we have the entire glucose molecule. And as we break it down, we release energy within the process. Um, and then with some of that available energy, we'll use it um, to break down that molecule further, or we'll take that energy and use it um, maybe to create or resynthesize ATP in order to break down ATP again um, for something like maybe a muscle contraction. Enzymes are there to speed up reactions. So they lower the energy necessary to perform reactions. This is very important when we get into how we're synthesizing ATP. Um, if we have less of the enzymes required to uh, maybe break down ATP or resynthesize ATP, it makes it more difficult for us to easily create those molecules. Um, some things that, that impact our enzymes are temperature and pH. Um, so the acidity and the temperature um, at which those enzymes are trying to work. Um, if our temperature is too low or too high, so that body temperature, the enzyme doesn't work to its full extent. And then if the pH changes or, or works to too acidic of a range, which we'll talk about how that's a limiter for these reactions, um, if pH gets too low or the body becomes more acidic, it slows enzyme activity. Okay. And, and these enzymes work kind of like a, a lock and key. Um, they work with those molecules in, in order to maybe assist in breaking down or synthesizing new molecules. And what we're going to talk about is the major piece when it comes to energy required for human function is the breakdown and resynthesizing of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Okay. This ATP molecule is the energy currency within our body. So we take adenosine triphosphate and we take off one of those phosphates, we carve one of those phosphates off, which releases a phosphate, a hydrogen ion, and available energy. Turns that ATP into ADP plus a phosphate, a hydrogen, and energy. And by taking that free phosphate and ADP and placing energy into the reaction, we can reform ATP 
in order to break it down again and again and again. Because ATP is stored in muscle, however, it is an extremely heavy molecule. It's used, or it's used um, constantly throughout our body for energy, but we can't just store tons of ATP within our muscle to break it down for energy. Okay. In reality, we use about 50 to 100 times our body weight in ATP every day, every 24 hour cycle, okay, depending on how much energy you expend within that day. So we can't carry that many individual ATP molecules. So we have to recycle or um, use phosphorylation to add phosphates back to ADP to create new ATP molecules. So we're constantly recycling these ATP molecules in order to allow us to have more energy for things like muscle contraction, which is what we're caring about specifically in this scenario. We do this through two pathways, the aerobic, which is the, or the anaerobic first. The anaerobic pathway does not require oxygen in order to rephosphorylate ATP. So we call this direct phosphorylation we're able to do this within the, um, within the sarcoplasm. We don't need the mitochondria for these reactions, but we're able to resynthesize ATP without the presence of oxygen. We can also use the aerobic pathway, which is with oxygen or requires oxygen molecules in order to phosphorylate ATP. Um, so we have two pathways and we'll talk about some of the sections within them and how we can use them to create ATP and some of the limitations of each. So the first step in anaerobic ATP production is using stored ATP within the muscle. Okay, so we have this available ATP within the muscle that's already been rephosphorylated and we are ready to use it. Depending on your muscle size, we'll determine how much ATP that muscle can store but it's very, very, very low. Um, think of it as just the energy needed for quick reflexive reactions, less than a second, initiating some kind of movement um, because once we break it down, it's gone and we can't carry too much of it. The next step is using the ATPPC system or also called the phosphocreatine system or the creatine phosphate system. Any of those are, they're all the same. Um, I'm going to refer to it as the ATPPC system. This is where we have creatine or, or phosphocreatine rather within the muscle and it stores free floating phosphates. So whenever we break down an ATP, we can use that phosphocreatine, which will take off or carve off one of those um, phosphates using an enzyme specifically creatine kinase, in order to rephosphorylate or phosphorylate ATP or ADP into ATP. And then we'll have another free floating um, creatine molecule that can absorb another phosphate. Okay. This, this system only works in a, in a short period of time. It runs out quickly, but it is a very a good short term available source of energy. So we're able to quickly phosphorylate ADP into ATP, um, especially in short, intense bursts of muscle contraction or, or movements. Um, but this does have kind of an effect on the cell environment of the muscle cell by allowing more hydrogen ions to accumulate within the cell. Okay, so this, is, this becomes an issue um, because it increases the acidity or lowers the pH which changes enzyme activity, which slows the reactions. The next step is glycolysis. So this occur occurs in the sarcoplasm or the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. Um, and this is allowed for, for a slightly larger period of time. Um, so we start using glycolysis as our primary energy creation system or ATP production system once we start running out of those the, the phosphocreatine system. Um, but it does yield a high amount of energy and it is done by breaking down glucose molecules. Okay, so this is where we're using free floating glucose molecules from the blood and those that are stored within the muscle. Um, 
but it does have kind of a time limit for this intense action, but it does work for longer than our previous two systems. So glycolysis, it does take energy to begin the reaction. So it requires two ATP to begin that reaction. Then it produces four ATP plus um, NADH, which carries hydrogen ions to the next stage. Um, and it also produces a it also produces uh, a byproduct, either pyruvate or lactate. The pyruvate and lactate can then be used later on for other metabolic reactions to create even more ATP. Um, but there are some limitations, especially when lactate is produced at a very high rate. Okay, so we start out by um, taking our glucose molecule and we have to import uh, two ATP, break them down um, in order to kind of facilitate that reaction, uh, but we get more ATP out than we put in. Uh, we continue to go through that reaction um, until we have our net two ATP and our lactate or our pyruvate. Um, we're not gonna go through all the details, you should have gone through them in your exercise physiology courses. I'll post up um, some videos also kind of helping you through that situation. Okay. Um, then we have these oxidation reduction reactions that occur um, to accept those hydrogen ions. So oxidation is when a molecule accepts a hydrogen ion. Um, reduction is when it donates an electron. So ADA or NAD, sorry, and FAD take on hydrogen ions in an oxidation reduction reaction in order to move those hydrogen ions to a new location so that we can use them to continue synthesizing new ATP. Okay. Um, when oxygen is available within the mitochondria, we're able to take those hydrogen ions, shuttle them using NAD and FAD, um, from glycolysis into the mitochondria to continue and move into the, the aerobic metabolism. Um, but that process is a little bit slower and sometimes we need energy a little bit more, more quickly. Um, so those hydrogen electrons, if they can't be moved into the mitochondria quick enough, they can also be accepted by pyruvate to form lactic acid or lactate. Um, this conversion process allows us to buffer some of the acidity that's, that's present with these hydrogen ions, but it's to an extent. So it's, it's less acidic than having free floating hydrogen ions, but it's more acidic than if we didn't have them available and we moved them into the mitochondria. Okay, so it's this glycolysis or this thing that is anaerobic metabolism is our speed method or fast method of creating energy for movement without requiring oxygen. But it does have its limitations with the higher levels of hydrogen ions present and will um, lead to a decrease in energy output over time as acidity begins to um, increase and increase. But lactate isn't all that bad. You've probably heard, heard terrible things about lactate or lactic acid accumulation or all of these bad connotations that come with lactate. But lactate can be used as a fuel source in aerobic metabolism and it can fuel other cells. So cells that are not working, muscle cells even, that aren't working currently under anaerobic need can use that lactate, can be shuttled to other muscle cells to be used for energy through aerobic metabolism. It can also be used to rebuild glucose through gluconeogenesis. So where we take those lactate, we're able to buffer those hydrogen ions, um, put the pyruvates back together and create more glucose. Um, this can happen in the liver. Um, so the lactic acid can be moved to the liver, put together and resynthesized as glucose or stored later for later on in the form of glycogen, which is a 
a bond of multiple glucose molecules. So why why are there these these limiters? Okay, these limiters are rate limiting enzymes. These are these are the points that will slow the rate of metabolic reactions. Okay, so your levels of ATP and ADP and um, free floating phosphates can limit ATP production because you only have so much that you can keep resynthesizing. Um, so if you have high levels of ATP currently available, you're not going to synthesize very much new ATP. It's going to limit itself um, because your body's only going to synthesize as much as it needs because as we talked about earlier, ATP is a heavy molecule. Um, we don't want to have a lot of it stored up because it's going to carry more weight. Um, if you have low levels of ATP and high levels of ADP and free floating phosphates, it's going to stimulate more ATP production or that resynthesis um, because we need that ATP available. A calcium uh, may also stimulate ATP production um, because it is also a signal through muscle contraction. We have calcium as one of our signals, which is saying, okay, we're, we're using these muscles. We're continually using them. We need to create more ATP. Um, so we have these rate limiting enzymes. Um, we have a few for each of these reactions. We'll start just off with the anaerobic ones. So um, our major rate limiting enzyme for the phosphocreatine system or the ATP PC system is creatine kinase or the that enzyme that we talked about earlier that allows us to break off that free floating phosphate or that phosphate from um, phosphocreatine in order to synthesize new ATP. So our stimulator for using that system is ADP present in the cell and the inhibitor is going to be ATP. So um, it's balancing itself out. It wants us to get back to that level that's that's more neutral. And then we move into glycolysis, which we're using glucose. Um, phosphofructokinase is our rate limiting enzyme there. It's what's going to um, limit our ability to break down that glucose molecule further. So um, AMP, adenosine monophosphate, um, ADP, and free floating phosphates, as well as a high pH, which is low levels of acidity, will stimulate um, the use of glycolysis. And then the inhibitors will be um, available ATP, um, available phosphocreatine, um, citrate, and a low pH. So lower pH being more acidic will inhibit the utilization of glycolysis. It's going to slow that enzyme's reaction, okay? Um, and one thing that we need to remember about this is that it's not all or nothing. Um, we're not only using one system. Um, oftentimes that's kind of how we start to think about these systems or energy systems when we first start learning about uh, bioenergetics, probably in exercise physiology, you start thinking, okay, we're in this system, now we're in this system, now we're in this system. Um, it's not an all or nothing situation. It's more of a predominantly this, less of this. It's kind of a, a sliding scale. So the whole body will never all be using one energy system. Um, at some times you'll be using one in one cell, you may not be using as much in other cells, um, working muscles may be using one while non-working muscles another. Um, muscles that are working very hard may use an anaerobic pathway while muscles that are more for stability that are just kind of working their on um, may be using aerobic pathway. So it's not everything or nothing. It's a sliding scale of more of this, less of this, now more of that, less of this. Um, so how we create this energy or utilize this energy comes from the interaction of the demands from each pathway. So how fast we need ATP is going to determine which energy system predominates our use as well as um, also the speed or the duration of the movement is going to impact also how much of each pathway we're going to use. So the rate at which we need ATP, if we need it at really high rates, right now, maximal effort, we're going to use predominantly anaerobic pathways within those muscles. 
Okay, so using immediate short-term pathways um, like stored ATP and our phosphocreatine system, um, move into glycolysis as that need is longer. So as, as we have a longer duration of effort, we may have to move into slower pathways um, like glycolysis compared to the ATPPC system. And then as we need um, more ATP and we've kind of used up that rate, our body's going to shift to predominantly aerobic creation of ATP. Um, rather than predominantly anaerobic. Our body may still be using anaerobic slightly in some areas. Um, so think about maybe you're running a lap around the track and you're using your aerobic system and then you sprint at the end, now you're using more anaerobic systems um, because that need changes. Um, but it may be not as much as if you just sprinted right off the gun and then you slowly worked your way into predominantly aerobic systems. So we kind of shift based on our needs for energy so which I, what i want you to take from that is that it's it's not all or nothing um, we're not always aerobic always anaerobic or at one time all anaerobic at one time all aerobic um, we shift based on the needs of those working muscles um, and our body always wants to be as efficient as possible so it's going to use anaerobic when it has to and it's going to choose aerobic when it can Okay, so we can also train this and we can train how we um, work through these energy systems. Um, so you can get faster at using a a or anaerobic energy systems um, by having more enzymes like, or also having more um, phosphocreatine within your muscle cell. Um, you're able to use that system for slightly longer um, if you have more enzymes, that can also play a role. Um, the enzymes availability is going to help you speed up those reactions. And this comes through training these energy systems. We'll get more into the methods of training later on in the semester. But next, let's move into aerobic ATP production. If you want to take a break now, this might be a good place to pause, go through your notes again over the anaerobic energy systems before we shift into aerobic. But Let's start with kind of the first step of aerobic ATP production, um, which comes after utilizing glycolysis first. Um, so we'll, we'll take it from a glycolysis standpoint where we now have these pyruvate and we need to, or we, or we then shuttle them into the mitochondria to begin the Krebs cycle, um, sometimes known as a citric acid cycle. Okay. This allows us to completely oxidate um, these substrates that we've used. So we're able to take out all of those hydrogen ions that are available um, and, and break down this molecule even further. So we, we use NAD and FAD to shuttle those free floating hydrogens again onto the electron transport chain, okay? Um, which is the, the final step through ATP production through aerobic systems. So um, the electron transport chain or electron transport system is the last piece where the electrons are then removed from NAD and FAD or NADH and FADH um, and are used or are, are then accepted by oxygen molecules to form water, which allows us to synthesize new ATP because those electrons that are given off allow us to resynthesize ATP. That's from kind of a basic sense. Um, so it's our way of formulating new ATP and we're able to do this to a larger extent than we could do it during glycolysis or um, using the ATPPC system. But because this takes more time, there's more steps. Um, it takes a longer period of time it will not be as useful during shorter term actions or things where you need maximum muscular work or muscular contraction um, in a short period of time. You don't have time to access ATP this way. You have to use those kind of short term pathways. Okay. So now we'll go through the, the three stages of oxidative phosphorylation. 
So this is kind of an overview of what happens through aerobic metabolism. We take our substrate, which could either be protein, um, it could be glucose, it could be um, taking triglycerides and, and breaking them down into individual lipids. Um, so we, we have, say, amino acids, which is the breakdown of protein. We then have pyruvate, which is when we break down um, glucose, we get to pyruvate. Or we take triglycerides and break them down into fatty acids. Um, a triglyceride has three fatty acids with a glycerol backbone. So we take maybe one of those fatty acids um, that we've broken down. Those substrates will then be broken down into acetyl coenzyme A and go through the same Krebs cycle. Um, but this occurs and the cycle keeps occurring um, for different periods of time based on the substrate. Um, so it's, it's faster to use pyruvates. It's a smaller molecule. Um, it's been broken down further and we can move through that system faster from pyruvate. It's a little slower through fatty acids, but we're able to gain more and more and more because those fatty acids are longer um, carbon chains. So we get more energy out of that system. And then as we go through the system, all of those NAD and FADH are moved into the electron transport chain, which then allows us to synthesize those ATP and get rid of those hydrogen ions by creating water from those oxygen molecules that we breathe in at the, the start when we began uh, respirating. Okay, so first of all, our fuels are carbohydrates, which could be glucose or glycogen. Um, it all depends on these carbon molecules. This is kind of the, the basis of our energy production using um, aerobic energy systems. So glucose is a six carbon molecule. Glycogen can, is longer, longer um, branch carbon molecules. So depending on how large that glycogen molecule is, will determine how many carbon molecules are available. Uh, glucose is, is stored in the muscle cells as well in the liver, also in the bloodstream. And um, we use those as more freely available, or we can also break down um, glycogen using glycogenolysis um, to break it down into say pyruvate in order to use it for more contraction. If we have one glucose molecule, we can yield about 32 ATP. It's, it's plus or minus um, based on how you organize those NAD and FAD, um, but we'll call it 32 as, as kind of a, an average. Aerobic metabolism, um, from one molecule of glycogen can yield up to 33 ATP. Um, so that's yield, that's, that's not including what we have to put in at the start. Um, but these are, this gives us quite a few ATP compared to the two that we get from that anaerobic um, glycolysis. But it's not very efficient. It's, it's efficiency rate is about 40% of all the energy available. 60% is, is left off as heat. So it's great, but it's not perfect. It's like your car engine. Um, it's efficient, but it could be more, but there's, there's a, quite a bit of energy that's released as heat. If we look at fats, for example, which can have 18 or more carbon molecules within a fatty acid, this is, these are larger, larger um, molecules with more carbons available. Whenever we break a carbon bond, that's where we really get a lot of that energy. Um, we store it as triglycerides either in the muscle cell or in our adipose tissue. Um, so that subcutaneous fat and that visceral fat can be broken down for energy. That's why we store adipose tissue or fat tissue so that we have stored energy for later if we may need it. Um, and then we use a system called beta oxidation to create um, fatty acids available for the Krebs cycle. So that's how we're, we're breaking down these large triglyceride molecules so that we can put them into the Krebs cycle and then go through that system over and over and over. Okay. Um, we're all able to store some of these fats in our bloodstream and within the cell, but as our energy demands increase, especially if we're not consuming high amounts of um, glucose or free energy, we're going to rely more on the stored um, energy that we have already available. 
And then the last one is proteins. Proteins are, are probably the least um, common energy source for our body to use during aerobic metabolism. Um, our body doesn't like to use proteins for energy. It's not going to be our number one pick. Um, proteins will be broken down into amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. Um, they're used mostly for structural components. Um, we don't store protein unless we're using it for structure. So we don't often use it for energy unless it's kind of leftover. But there are carbons available within amino acids, so we can use them for energy. Um, but it does take a little bit more put in to get that energy out. So it's less efficient and it's not used as often. If we're using things like long duration movement, um, we may use maybe 15% of our energy from protein, um, but it's going to be very low on the, on the majority of the time. So we don't think of it as a primary. Um, think of it as kind of like our last resort energy system or energy substrate. Um, we will often use triglycerides or glucose as much as possible or glycogen as much as possible when it comes to creating energy for our movement. So how these all fit together is that regardless of the substrate, it must be broken down into acetyl coenzyme A in order to go into the Krebs cycle so that we can produce more ATP. Okay, glucose or glycogen is our, our best bet. It's our easiest. There's the least byproduct. It's, it's really there for us to use for energy. Um, triglycerides, same thing. We can use those fatty acids, break them down into acetyl coenzyme A, use them for the Krebs cycle. And we can get lots of lots of energy from those triglycerides. With amino acids, we do have a byproduct of urea. Um, so someone who is using a lot of protein or amino acids as their energy substrate um, will have a more harsh smelling urine um, from that urea um, and measuring the urea or the, those extra nitrogens really in the in the urine can tell us if, if you're using too much or too much protein as an energy source um, but that's more on the, the clinical side um, you also see there's there's ketone bodies uh, ketogenic diet is another um, Thing that we talk about or that you may have heard um, but it can uh, ketone bodies can also be used um, for the Krebs cycle but we don't think of them as a primary energy substrate um, they're kind of a last resort when you don't have enough easier to utilize energy substrates like glucose okay now let's go back to those rate limiting enzymes but now we can look at them for the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain um, we often don't see these as limiters in a lot of sense um, our body is really limited when it comes to aerobic energy systems there's going to be more limitations there um, when it comes to using the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain we're not going to see as many issues we're just not going to use it if we don't have to um, but this energy system is made to use all the time. Um, so you sitting here at rest, listening to this lecture, you're probably using primarily aerobic pathways. There's nothing that's really going to be limiting them um, unless you don't have enough energy substrates or if you change to the other energy systems. Um, this is kind of our default energy system. Um, now let's look at it from a source of exercise, carbohydrate, um, which is glucose. Um, if you break it down um, in most sense. Um, blood glucose and muscle glycogen are going to be your primary sources for carbohydrates during exercise. Um, as that exercise increases, you may utilize fatty acids, um, primarily those available within the bloodstream or those that are within the muscle, the triglycerides within your muscle. Um, you may use those often during intense high velocity fast movements, we'll choose carbohydrates first. Um, and we'll use those as much as possible unless we're at a low enough intensity or we're able to use fats more efficiently than we may use those. Um, most often during an endurance events um, or periods of rest between exercise bouts. And then protein, maybe, um, hopefully not. We're trying to spare as much protein metabolism as possible because we'd rather use that protein to create structure within our body and allow recovery.
Okay, the last one is actually blood lactate. Blood lactate can be used to resynthesize glucose within the liver. So we can also use lactate because it is really just um, pyruvate with extra hydrogen ions. So if we look at this from a from exercise intensity standpoint, more of an endurance view, um, if the exercise is shorter, um, we're going to choose of a shorter intensity, lower VO2 max, we're going to choose more of those fatty acid availability. Um, as we shift towards higher outputs, we're going to use more glucose and glycogen. So think of it as kind of like a need-based scenario. Um, if you need the energy sooner, faster, you're going to use um, more easier energy substrates like glucose. If you don't need it as quickly and you need a lot of it, you'll choose more of those efficient energy sources like fats. Um, and as we exercise, there is kind of this crossover. If we're, we're low intent, um, shorter duration, uh, you're going to use more fats compared to if you're um, working at really high work rates, you need energy now, you're going to use carbohydrates. It's the most efficient right now. Fat is the most efficient for high quality or high quantity. Um, so based on how much muscle you're using, how quickly you need that energy and also some hormone um, involvement, epinephrine, which think of that as, as kind of our, one of our go hormones, our arousal hormones, will stimulate um, glycogenolysis, which is going to um, break down glycogen into glucose, it's going to make it freely available for us in the bloodstream. Um, so that's why when you're in that arousal state, it's really easy to get that free energy um, quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, as exercise prolongs, we're going to shift more towards fat metabolism because you are able to produce so many more ATP from using fat compared to using carbohydrate. And if we're exercising for long duration, especially at lower intensities, we're going to choose the more, um, the more bang for our buck um, type of energy like fats. And that's why our body stores energy as, as triglycerides because we're able to store much more in a smaller area and we can use it again later on for energy. So it's easier for us in the long term. So most of the time when you're at rest, you're probably using triglycerides for energy unless you're working up your, your heart rate and you're, you're working up your muscular recruitment, you may shift more into carbohydrates. Um, so it's never all or none. Um, it's always kind of think of it as a give and take, but carbohydrates are always going to be key, especially for brain fuel. Um, carbohydrates are going to be the primarily energy substrate for our brain um, because it's, it's the easiest to break down. Um, so we can have this kind of mental fatigue when we're lacking carbohydrate. Um, and it, we also need carbohydrate in order to metabolize fat. Um, so the saying goes that, that fat burns in a flame of carbohydrates. Um, when we have low levels of glycogen from, from long-term exercise, um, high intensity, maybe you're, you're doing something like a long distance run, long distance cycle, long distance swim, um, if we can't keep up carbohydrate metabolism, it's going to slow down our work rate because it, reduce, uh, it reduces the availability of substrates for the Krebs cycle and the intermediate. So what happens in between? Um, and it, it slows our ability to break down fats um, to be used within the Krebs cycle. Okay, so when we're looking at long duration exercise, we're going to use um, triglycerides, free fatty acids, glucose, glycogen, as much as we can until we have to shift into a more um, fat dominant energy fuel um, system or, or we have to use more fats for fuel. Um, because if we're working, our body wants to use the quickest, easiest energy source, which is glucose and glycogen. But as energy requirements increase, we, we need to shift the other direction. 
Um, but if, as you see here, this is um, long duration exercise, um, four hours of continuous exercise. That's a long time to be continually moving. Um, but what we're going to see more often in, in the field of strength and conditioning is um, rest to exercise transitions. So think about this as the rest interval within that sport. So maybe you're playing soccer, you're playing football, you have a period of high intense exercise, and then you have to take a break. Or you're moving for a longer period of time, and then you rest. Um, at the at the start of your your movement, you're going to quickly use more anaerobic pathways first um, because they're easier to utilize right away and it will get you going. But that also leaves this oxygen deficit that you have to um, make up for because you've started using anaerobic pathways, which accumulates more acidity. We need oxygen to take up those hydrogen ions at the end of our electron transport chain. So there's going to be kind of this, this point where we're, we don't have as much oxygen as we need and we have to catch back up. Um, but once you reach kind of a steady state level where you're, you're using the same amount or you're, you're requiring the same amount of oxygen continuously, you're able to kind of catch that back up. Um, and now you're using more aerobic metabolism, you're able to kind of backfill what you needed earlier on in that session. Okay, um, we also have to look at this exercise step if we're maybe going back to that steady state VO2, but it's dropped back down to rest. Um, EPOC or excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, so you breathing very hard after you finished, um, or the, it also causes your VO2 to elevate after you finish exercising, um, is where your body is kind of making up for what was used earlier with consuming more oxygen. We're able to take up all of those extra hydrogen ions, as well as recycle that previously broken down ADP. Um, so all of those free ATP that were available, all of the, um, ATP and those phosphocreatine that were available that you broke down and, and used them all up um, at the start of your exercise or the start of your training, you're now backfilling and, and resetting all of those energy stores. Um, it's, it takes a, a shorter period of time to resynthesize those, but it is going to cause you to breathe heavier um, and take in more oxygen. Um, there is this fast portion of EPOC and a slow portion. Um, to EPOC, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. At the fast portion, so this is kind of right after you're done, you're going to resynthesize stored phosphocreatine and replace oxygen stores that were available or that were um, used up earlier. So you're, you're quickly resynthesizing the fastest form of energy. So in case your body has to go again, you have that available to you. It, Think about this as you're doing maybe some sprint intervals. Maybe you're doing 10 yard sprint intervals with one minute rest. Um, you're doing multiple of those reps. You do the first one, um, you used up a bunch of phosphocreatine. Now you're breathing kind of heavy. You're resynthesizing them. The next one you go, and the next one you go, next one you go. After each of those repetitions, you're quickly resynthesizing the stored creatine phosphates so that you can go again in case you have to go again. Um, and it starts to kind of build up as you get further and further. Um, you're not able to go or not able to resynthesize them quick enough if you have too short of a rest interval. Um, so you don't allow that, that rest time to resynthesize stored for creatine phosphate fast enough. You're not able to keep your work rate up as high as it was at the start. Um, that's the importance of rest intervals when we talk about the application portions. Um, but it, it takes you probably about a minute um, if you're using the, the kind of the rule of thumb with sprint intervals, we'll kind of give this one a, an extra, um, depending on how many yards or meters you sprint. So if it's 10 yards, you need one minute, 20 yards, two minutes, 30 yards, three minutes for full recovery to um, go back into that work up to about um, 100 meters, which would you would need about 10 minutes 
for full recovery. Then we have our slow portion. Um, this one, think of this as kind of like the whole next day. Um, we're going to have elevated body temperature, elevated catecholamines. We'll talk about those more in the in our hormonal section, which is later on this week. Um, and we're also going to convert those lactate um, or the lactic acid that was built up back into glucose through gluconeogenesis. So this is this is a longer portion. This is throughout the rest of that day. Say you do your session in the morning. Throughout the day, you're going to have an elevated body temperature. You're going to be continually using energy to resynthesize those glucose. Um, this is one of the benefits of using intense exercise as a form of, um, think of it as maybe it's your fat loss technique um, because you're able to elevate body temperature and continue energy utilization long after exercise has stopped. Um, so this is one of those, those benefits that happen later on. But what happens to lactate? I talked about it earlier as a fuel source. Um, lactate can build up in the cell um, and inhibit uh, phosphofructokinase from working, which slows glycolysis, which causes fatigue, discomfort, um, slows down your performance. Um, think of this as the, the burn that you're feeling um, as you're doing those 200 meter sprints. Um, you're doing those 30 second, 40 second, 60 second intervals. Um, it's starting to hurt. You're feeling, feeling that pain. You're slowing down later on. Um, that lactate or that, that built up of hydrogen ions is slowing down your, your performance. Um, a lower pH or more acidity also does cause discomfort and pain. Um, but lactate can then leave the cell and go into the blood. We can, we can measure that. Um, but it can also be reconverted back to pyruvate through aerobic systems and used through the Krebs cycle. And boom, boom, we have more energy there also. But it takes a little bit more time. So we can't use it right away in that working muscle cell. We can use it in others. Um, Lactate threshold is that point where um, blood lactate rises to. Um, it's also our kind of our anaerobic threshold or the onset of blood lactate. So we're, we're at a steady rate, but then as lactate begins to accumulate, we've passed the level at which we can filter that lactate out of our muscle into our blood and it begins to accumulate. Um, and we're not able to slow down that production, we've moved into more of an anaerobic system rather than an aerobic system. So if you're trying to train below lactate threshold, you have to train at the level just below your body begins to use more of an anaerobic energy system. Um, so lactate threshold is really determined by low muscle oxygen, so you're not able to get enough oxygen in to maintain aerobic metabolism. There's accelerated glycolysis, so you're using a lot of glucose. Um, you're using fast twitch muscle fibers, and you have this reduced rate of lactate removal. Um, once those all kind of culminate together, we've hit the point where we're unable to shuttle out lactate, which is going to cause us to either uh, have to end our training or end our work because we've gone into um, a too slow of a system, or we're going to have to lower our work rate or how much we're doing, how hard, how fast, how much, um, in order to go back into a primarily aerobic system. Um, so we can we can kind of use we can use onset of blood lactate if you have that available. Um, so if you're able to measure it, you can use it, um, but you can't work too high for too long. Um, it's kind of this limitation for us, especially during a or more longer duration or middle distance events. Um, it's not as much of an issue when it comes to um, interval based events or um, high level aerobic events. You're able to maintain a pretty high level, but if you are able to keep underneath that lactate threshold, you're able to keep that work for longer periods of time. Um, but it is a benefit for you to be in a more aerobic system. Um, requires less energy, less pain, less fatigue. Um, 
So there are benefits. Um, but if we're looking at this from um, kind of a, a, a work availability, if we're able to stay within a anaerobic system for longer, we're able to um, handle high levels of lactate and high levels of hydrogen ions within our muscle, we're able to work at a higher output for longer. Um, but if we're able, if we want to perform something like an endurance event, this isn't going to be the issue. We're going to want to um, be able to shuttle out those hydrogen ions into the mitochondria to use them for ATP production um, and get rid of them using oxygen. Okay. So how can we train this system or, or train, train our lactate threshold? Um, first of all, with endurance training, we do grow more mitochondria, so there's more available locations for us to shuttle um, that lactate to. Um, we're also able to produce, or we, we don't produce as much lactate because we're able to um, utilize more of that ATP because we can produce more within the mitochondria. We also have faster lactate clearance. So um, as we perform endurance training, there's more capillarization within those muscle cells. Um, so there's more locations at which we can get that lactate out because there's more blood available within the muscle. There's more blood or locations where the lactate can ship into the blood. There's more places for lactate to go, which are not in the muscle. So you can continue that work for longer periods. Uh, so as we train using um, endurance training methods, we can train ourselves to increase our running velocity while maintaining a lower lactate or maintaining underneath lactate threshold, um, and which would mean that we have a higher maximum threshold. If we have a higher maximum threshold, we can run faster without getting tired sooner. Uh, and we could also run maximally faster or move maximally faster, which is an improvement in our performance. So this is what happens with more of the endurance training methods um, or think of your conditioning and the strength and conditioning. We're trying to move that lactate threshold over so that we can go faster for longer. Um, if you can outrun that competition or outmove that competition, you have a chance to win that competition. Lactate can also be used as a fuel source. Uh, it can be broken back down into pyruvate as well as shipped to the liver to be broken or to be resynthesized into glucose or glycogen so that we can use it for energy later. And it can be used as fuel for the heart. Um, the heart is our aerobic muscle. Our heart loves to be aerobic. It can convert lactate to pyruvate very easily and use it for energy because our heart is always beating uh, right now, maybe some of your muscles aren't um, contracting. They're probably not using very much energy. They're probably just using enough to um, stay there. Um, our heart still going. So it, it's very good at using lactate uh, as a fuel source. Um, it's, ex it's also um, in slow twitch muscle fibers, um, which are even better or also better at um, using um, pyruvate for energy after broken it down from lactate. Um, so there are a lot of positives here. So lactate isn't the devil. Um, lactic acid isn't the devil. It's not awful. Um, it is useful. It's just a byproduct. It's a way for us to quickly buffer acidity in the moment while we're performing glycolysis. Um, so it's kind of our quick fix. It's the band-aid on the situation. Um, and as we build up more band-aids, it's going to cause a problem. Um, but at the same time, we can still use it on um, in other muscles, other non-working muscles, and still have a positive from that lactate being produced. All right, I have a few review questions here. Um, go through these, um, go back through the lecture, check your notes. Um, we'll talk about uh, which energy system is using high intensity short duration activity, um, which energy systems allow for the greatest ATP production, why is controlling hydrogen ion accumulation important? What happens to lactate? Um, which fuel source is the most efficient? Which fuel source is used most during high intensity activity? Think of efficient as we get the most out of the least. Um, 
And then which fuel source is used during high intensity activity, think about also low intensity activity. Um, and how can we train lactate threshold um, and what happens when we do that. All right, thank you for watching. Make sure you go through your quiz and the um, other lecture for this section. Have a great day.